Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Today is the day. The day that it be all begins. The day of my massacre shall begin. All the kids in school will in fear and hide. From the wrath of my power, they will know who I am. I am nothing. I am no one. My life is nothing and meaningless. Every day I see the world ending another day. You will all see. You will all know who my name is. On one day or another, you will end and we'll all die. Welcome back to I Could Murder a Podcast. It is that time again, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. We are in Boston Sound. Producer Dan is at the desk mixing away. Oh, yeah. I love it, me. You do, don't you? And then Ben. Hello. It's so nice to see you again. So nice to be back. Thank yeah. you for having me. I That's appreciate right. it. You're a guest host. Today. Yeah, there's gonna we're looking, we are looking around. Yep. So let us know if you're interested. But how are you? Yeah, really good. Yeah, it feels good to be back. I'm only guesting this week, which... I feel less nervous about. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So last week we covered the Black Panther case. We missed a really obvious gag, which immediately kicked myself after the after filming it. Um, he tried to do a taxi rank, Black Panther cabs. There you go. Um, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah, we missed it. Very, I'm very angry. Tom was that. so angry that he kicked a curb, ladies in, and gentlemen, in front of teenagers. Uh, I was by myself wearing Crocs. And in, all in all, embarrassing. We live to fight another day. We do indeed. We do indeed. And another day, another case. This particular one. We wanted to start with a bit of a precursor because we're very aware that at the time of recording this episode, Nicholas Cruz's sentencing is ongoing. We're also aware that there is a massive amount of emotion surrounding the case, as there rightly should be. So we just wanted to uh, put a little trigger warning out there that we are going to be covering graphic descriptions of events, as well as testimonies from survivors that may cause distress uh, to some viewers or listeners. Big shout out to Phil as well, our animator, who at the beginning, it was his idea to depict the, the victims of the case, not glorifying what happened. So that's a real nice touch from him. So yeah, big shout out to Phil. Definitely. So we are covering the case of Nicholas Cruz, the Parkland school shooter, also known as the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. So as we dive into this case, you will see uh, a series of systematic failures in both uh, the mental health support that was available or is available, as well as clinical teams, social services and law enforcement parties that seem to either essentially ignore the warning signs or sort of shift them on to a different team of professionals to deal with. Either way, there are a significant number of, I mean, this this whole childhood section that we're going to go through now is just warning sign after warning sign after warning sign and nothing was acted on this until it was far too late a quote which we feel is quite appropriate given that his sentencing is still very much ongoing comes in from the Broward County public defender Howard Finkelstein it goes as follows lock him up forever throw away the key and never speak his name maybe it will curtail some of the pain and hurt that certainly will happen if this case continues on a decades-long march to death very powerful quote there. I'm sure that's echoed by many people thinking about this case, wanting it to just be resolved, closure, and everyone to move on, and his name to be out of the media, and you know the media circus that's more than likely going to ensue following this case as time goes on. We're going to look at the early life of Nicholas Cruz, and we're going to kind of see the red flags, like Ben was mentioning, that are very much present, and see where perhaps things could have been, you know, 
different if, if people were to intervene. But yeah, we're going to get into it now and go through the early life of Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Jacob Cruz was born on the 24th of September 1998 in the city of Margate in Florida, which is part of the Miami metropolitan area. Off the bat, what do we know about Margate, Florida? First thing I picked up, very different from our Margate Mm -hmm. down in Kent, I believe. Seaside town, I've heard it's a very good night out. Margate. Margate, yeah. yeah. Margate. Been for a night out? No, I think think I've shot a video there, a music video there before. At night? No, during the day, Ben. Good? It was rainy. But really long pier. Okay. Really yeah. long pier. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, the one over in Florida, I'm sure it has many, many piers, many beautiful beaches. Probably not as long though. Probably not. I mean, everything's bigger in America though, I've heard. All right. I've just heard. I've not seen it for myself. So the Margate in Florida is home to the Calypso Cove Water Park. Which I love water parks. I'd love for us free to go to one one day, maybe. I don't know. And the city's motto is together we make it great. It is known for, as I said, its many beautiful beaches and it's tucked between Coral Springs and Coconut Creek, which I think sounds lovely. Cruz's biological mother, Brenda Woodard, gave Nicholas up immediately after he was born and played no role in his upbringing whatsoever. What is interesting about Brenda is that she had a lengthy criminal history, violence and drug addiction, as well as many strings of arrests and spent time in various prisons. It is widely believed that she frequently smoked crack cocaine and marijuana, whilst also drinking copious amounts of alcohol whilst pregnant with Nicholas. She was even arrested for crack cocaine purchase whilst heavily pregnant with Nicholas. So he's got, obviously, his biological mother and then we'll talk about his biological half-sister. And they both have very shady backgrounds, a long, long rap sheet. And although they weren't involved in his life at all, what I found really interesting was particularly the fact that um, Brenda continued to indulge in various drugs and alcohol whilst Mm. heavily pregnant with him. Surely that had a knock-on effect on his... Um, it's a ripple effect, isn't it? And yeah. that's it's, it's the question in nature and nurture, isn't it? It's like, it's like if that's in your blood and within... And, you know, in, if you're born, you know, if your parents are taking drugs or whatever whilst you're born, you can even be born with a dependency yourself. So, yeah, it's certainly not going to have helped him uh, develop as a baby. So though she played no active part in his upbringing, there definitely are factors as a result of Brenda that heavily influenced who Nicholas was. A member of the state's prosecution team would later go on to say, it is not necessarily her past, but how her past contributed to his genetic makeup. Her use of drugs and alcohol while she was pregnant with him and how her genetic makeup was passed on to him. So between 1980 and the early 2000s, Brenda was arrested almost 30 times. Some of her charges included domestic violence, battery, weapons possession, car theft, drugs possession, burglary, fleeing from law enforcement and physical assault for which she served numerous different prison sentences. That's a long list. On one particular occasion in 2010, whilst living in shared accommodation within a Florida retirement complex, Brenda beat her housemate unconscious with a tire iron. She also threatened to burn a neighbour's house down. Wow. Hmm. Nicholas also had a biological half-sister who was born to Brenda, Danielle Woodard. Danielle is also a habitual offender and drug user and has her own extensive list of interactions with law enforcement and the prison services. Some of her charges include attempted second-degree murder for which she served an eight-year sentence, cocaine possession, credit card fraud, fleeing from law enforcement and battery. In total, Danielle was arrested 17 times and two of those arrests were for carrying firearms into schools. Which is, that's a very interesting part of it. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing. He, so he literally, as soon as he was born, no interactions with his uh, half-sister, no interactions with his biological mother. But yet the similarities mm. in some of his behaviours, as well as the fact that potentially the drug and alcohol abuse whilst pregnant with him, you're going to see that sort of repeat behaviour here as we go into his childhood. So although neither played any physical part in Cruz's childhood, it is very interesting to note that their criminal histories as well as their dependence on substances are something, as I mentioned, you will see later in Nicholas's childhood. It can also be proven that continued substance abuse as well as alcohol abuse whilst pregnant can have a significant impact on the health of your baby. As soon as he was born, Nicholas was adopted by Linda and Roger Cruz. The couple had also adopted another boy who would become Nicholas's brother, Zachary Cruz. So Linda and Roger were both very hardworking individuals and were financially stable at the time that they adopted the boys. And obviously both of them also had absolutely no criminal history uh, whatsoever. The couple purchased a large house with lots of nearby wooded areas in the suburb of Parkland. So Parkland was, at the time, one of the safest cities in the state with some of the best schools in the state. So it seemed like a sensible decision from the family to move there. From an early age, however, Nicholas exhibited behaviours that were concerning to Roger and Linda. 
They believed early on that he had ADHD due to his constantly high energy as well as his drastically shifting moods and attentions, but he was not evaluated for this until later in life. He frequently displayed inappropriate and dangerous behaviours, but his mother Linda seemed to try and disrupt this by spoiling him, often allowing him to play violent video games and watch films that had elements of violence. She would later go on to visit various weapon ranges with Nicholas, and she would even buy weapons for him. Nicholas's behaviour would occur at school, in the community and at home. When Nicholas was just 10 years old, Linda had to call the local police to the house. That particular call was the first of dozens of times over the next decade that she would have to make a call to law enforcement, often for help to keep her sons under control. Roger Cruz sadly died in August of 2004 at the age of 67, when Nicholas was 15 years old, leaving Linda to raise their two adopted boys by herself. Neither of the Cruz boys seemed to be too impacted by the loss of their father, and both of them began to walk all over her in the absence of the father figure. And there are many allegations that both of them were abusive to Linda physically. This dynamic is really, really interesting because although there was some warning signs whilst Roger was in the house as soon as Roger passed away it seems like the boys completely begin to act out against uh, against Linda here and it just gets worse and worse as time goes on. So not long after Roger's passing police began to regularly attend the crew's household. They were mainly called to break up fights between Nicholas and his brother Zachary however they were also called to the house several times due to Nicholas's aggressive tantrums and threats of violence. Neighbours in their community claim to have seen police squad cars in the crew's driveway at least once every fortnight. Of the total of 23 incidents that deputies responded to at the crew's house, 18 of them involved Nicholas Cruz. The Parkland Sheriff's Office said that none of the particular incidents appeared arrestable under Florida law. In November of 2013, Linda claimed that she was pinned against a wall by Nicholas because she took away his Xbox. The following year, deputies reported that neighbours had called to claim that Cruz was witnessed using a BB gun to shoot a neighbour's chicken. I would have thought this is where social services intervene and say this sadly isn't working out if the police have been called 23 times. Where's the responsibility there of the social workers to be like... You know, this adoption, Roger passed away, but things are exacerbating and going mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. It's really interesting because they, they adopted the boys from a very early age. They had a nice big house. They had, from the outside looking in, you know, picture perfect lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But obviously behind the scenes, things were very, very different. But then as soon as um, Roger passes away, this just, this switch just clicks. Yeah, Linda is left almost a victim in this situation. So a Parkland neighbour claimed that on several occasions she saw both Nicholas and Zachary Cruz being rough with the Cruz family dogs. She also described claims from a different neighbour who had witnessed the Cruz brothers holding down a neighbour's cat as they let their dogs attack it. The cat sustained significant injuries and was taken to Coral Springs Animal Hospital. So obviously that's a huge red flag that we've um, discussed for many cases, obviously the abuse of animals and it's a clear sign of like lack of empathy and just like that horrible violent streak. Mm -hmm. So Cruz attended and was expelled from various schools due to continued misbehaviours and issues regarding attendance. In fact, he was transferred between six different schools during a three-year period. Parkland was known for having some of the best schools in the state, but none of them were able to accommodate or change Cruz's negative attitude and behaviours. So as a result of this, Cruz was sent to attend a specialist school for young people with learning disabilities and emotional and behavioural difficulties, before eventually, two years later, going on to attend Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. So whilst attending this specialist school, some of Cruz's misbehaviours included breaking windows, breaking exit signs, pulling the fire alarm and screaming inappropriate slurs during classes. One particular classmate claimed that Cruz used to look up disfigured people on the internet and he found the whole thing hilarious. Cruz also regularly looked up firearms on the school computer. Another school friend also claimed that Cruz would look up the number 666 on the classroom computer and also regularly looked at disturbing images. Cruz once also looked up how to make a nail bomb. Mm. All of this on school computers. Yeah, whether that came out you know, afterwards, or they were at all made aware of those searches. Who knows? Cruz once destroyed a different student's class project on purpose because of the fact that he said he did not want the other students to receive a better grade than he did. Cruz carried a number of extremist views, including views that were racist, homophobic, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic. Where has that come from in his life? It seems like some of it's shock tactics in terms of, you know, the things he's searching in school. Maybe that's him trying to, you know, show off to other students and be that that guy kind of thing but yeah to suddenly acquire those online i don't know it's it's yeah, it's tricky isn't it there's one particular student who in, in one of the documentaries i watched said that he would introduce himself to new students as the school troublemaker oh. so maybe like you said he's trying to be any attention is good attention mm. in, in his book so he's trying to be as edgy but also he's just trying to i think he's trying to ruffle some feathers 
So it, it's speculated as to where these extremist views came from. Obviously, his half-brother was black. He lived in a multicultural household, but he still carried lots of racist, homophobic, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic views. I think sometimes there are people who feel lost and go down a rabbit hole online, find people you know, with that kind of views, and they're very impressionable. They can then start you know, feeling part of that community. And it's, it's yeah, it, I don't know, it's just speculating. So Cruz would also frequently get in heated arguments with his adopted brother, Zachary, to the point where he once pointed a gun at Zachary's head after an argument regarding food at the family dinner table. It's just, yeah. just... Zachary bit into some chicken and it was, there's a BB pellet in the, in the chicken. Um, I've got to be, I've got to pick and choose where I can try and have some light relief. So I thought, yeah. just, just on the, the chicken. Zachary stated Cruz had severe temper tantrums and would often destroy things or punch holes into walls when he would lose playing Call of Duty. We've got a very good Call of Duty player in the house. Tango down. Sitting at the deck. He's he, probably sniping someone as we speak. He always watches his own kills back, doesn't he? Yeah. Because right, they're so good. They're so good. <laughs> Worst sort of insane. <laughs> <laughs> Cruz's love for weaponry would not end at video games. A school friend said that Cruz once explained to him that his mother had purchased a shotgun for him and that he would be given the shotgun to take hunting with him in the Everglades. Everglades, big woodland area. I had to Google Everglades when Jim Carrey made that cameo in the office. He, get, he was going to the interview, but he got lost in the Everglades. It wasn't the Everglades. Was it not the Everglades? No. Finger links. Yeah. Shit. People disappear in the Finger Lakes. In the Everglades, I, I went on a, one of those fan boats when you uh, go around swamping is it like swamps there's a lot of like where crocodile is it cro oh, i'll be i think it's alligators it's alligators yeah i'm always I think. bad with that crocs are australia alligators are america is that right i don't know if it's the easiest that but there's quite a few in africa as well of either i don't know egypt is in africa so yeah fuck off what just happened i said egypt think forget it is in africa because you know crocodiles you told me how to fuck off I told you how to fuck off you just told me to fuck off yeah yeah <laughs> all right so yeah, so um, he told he told school friends that his mum had bought him a shotgun to take hunting in the Everglades. There were also rumours that Cruz would practice throwing knives at a tree. The same friend described an incident where after school hours, Cruz approached him and basically he was carrying a lunchbox, opened up the lunchbox and it was just full of bullets. Mm, that's a high iron diet. That's fantastic. And uh, when he showed him this lunchbox full of bullets, he basically claimed that he wanted to carry out a school shooting similar to the University of Texas Tower shooting conducted by Charles Whitman. Yeah, like you, like you said at the beginning, there's so many little moments here, which you hope a lot of this didn't, well, emerge after it. What, what would go on to happen happened. I know there's even more things that go on that happened beforehand and you're like, it's, how is this not Someone been? should have reported that. Yeah, and sadly in today's society, in the last year, there's been... Oh. Over 200 days into 2022, there has been an average of 13 mass shootings a week in America. That doesn't just... That doesn't feel right. 13 mass shootings mm. a week. I mean, I guess they're classifying a, um, a mass shooting as more, more than, than one person. Mm. I would have thought. 13 a week so far in 2022. Three or four victims is the minimum amount to be considered a mass shooting. In, in June alone, there were 65 mass shootings. That is... Six days with none. What point I was going to make later in the episode, but it seems fitting to make it now. After 9-11, mm -hmm. and we're, we're not a political podcast, we're not, we don't get too stancy, but after 9-11, they made so many changes to the airport and to security at airports that there's not really been anything since 9-11 similar to it. After the Oklahoma City bombing, they monitored purchases of chemicals and people with suspicious internet browsing history. Mm -hmm. With school shootings or mass shootings, why have they never... I mean, I know gun laws change all the time, but not significantly enough to stop things like this happening. It seems to be a mass shooting has to occur in a certain place and then that school itself takes on the new stance where it's like metal detectors and all this stuff. And it's like, well... That's not preventative enough, no, is it? it's reactive. What was the number down for June of this year? 65. 65 mass shootings. And you said that there was six days where there six, were none. Six mm. days with none, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute baffling figure and yeah i mean um, we i'm sure again we're, we're we're just echoing what a lot of people think well, and feel so about us, yeah. we get like a sky news alert every time there's there is one in america and it's just like every other week well i'm obviously we're not in the in the know completely about every single one but it's just yeah staggering 
Cruz would very often make remarks about committing and idolizing mass shootings. He once remarked about the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, saying that he was glad that they killed all those gay black people. Cruz also frequently used and drew the term white power on various walls and items of clothing. Cruz once showed a school friend a picture of a decapitated cat. Cruz bragged about his firearms collections and the dozens of animals he had killed. It is important to note that none of this information was ever reported until after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. There's going to be so much of this, like every every few lines of his childhood is just how has that happened how has that not been reported cruz worked as a cashier at a dollar store called the dollar tree which is a role that he claimed to resent he made very few friends whilst working there so after his father roger passed away linda cruz became adamant about not using online banking due to concerns that her sons could access her account when she was home with them she also expressed concerns that both of her sons nicholas and zachary would damage the house if she was gone for any extended periods of time. At some point, and perhaps also linked to Roger passing away, money became a problem for the Cruz family, and Linda ended up selling their Parkland home in early 2017, and, and essentially she pushed through for a quick sale uh, to get money for the property quickly. Helen Pasquiola, a neighbour of the Cruz family, said, I saw Nicholas and I said, are you moving? And he said, we cannot afford to live here anymore. So perhaps feeling more vulnerable without Roger, I guess physically and financially, Linda Cruz said to a friend that she did not want Nicholas to live with her anymore once he turned 18 because she was in fear of what that might mean for other people. The same witness would describe frequently hearing Nicholas screaming at Linda and threatening her whilst talking with her on the telephone. So you've adopted him, you've also adopted Zachary and as soon as he turns 18 that's it. Mm. is essentially what she's planning. So there's got to have been something either said or done or both. Well, I mean, her calling the police over 20 times is probably enough for any parent to be like, if you're not happy under this household, then... I mean, a lot of, a lot of people do have that opinion once 18. Like, it was a very classical, it was probably quite an old-fashioned uh, mm. opinion of like, that's a time when you can leave the house. The same witness heard Nicholas Cruz threaten to kill his mother and burn the house down. He apparently repeatedly told Linda to kill herself and that if she wouldn't do it, he would do it for her and burn the house down with her in it so that he can watch her burn. He further stated that nobody would be able to stop him from doing what he needed to do. Linda Cruz recalled many of her friends hysterically crying over the telephone that the boys, Nicholas and Zachary, were abusive towards her. She also claimed that Nicholas would regularly break things inside the home, punch the walls, and he even broke the television. Linda's friends would describe Linda of having to whisper over the phone out of fear that Nicholas would hear her on the phone and react negatively or aggressively towards her. Which she, she's, How terrifying is that in your own home with your own son? Yeah. Cruz would tell his mother to go fuck herself and wish that she would die. Cruz stated things to the effect that with Linda gone, he would be able to do whatever he wanted. Every kind of passing hour that Linda is alone with those boys, she's becoming more and more vulnerable. At the age of 15, Nicholas also once struck a neighbourhood child on the head with a ladle. And due to the fact that this happened outside the family home and with another family's child, he was referred to various mental health teams as a result. But when passed between different counsellors and therapists, many of them basically recommended involuntary treatment for Nicholas, it was never actually sought. So he never actually got the treatment that they would recommend. Mm. And that will be a recurring pattern throughout this timeline of events. Linda uh, regularly tried to hide the Wi-Fi access at home because she was concerned about Nicholas's internet activity. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit because it's unbelievable the type of things that he was searching. Linda looked at Nicholas's internet search history and learned that he had searched about weapons, amongst many other things. Nicholas once told his mother that he was going to blow up a school and the reason that he had been moved between so many schools, he basically told his mother that he was being bullied rather than he was kicked out because he had threatened other people. So he's also manipulating situations and lying to his mother there. So we talked about we were going to look at some of Nicholas Cruz's internet search history. Some of it is disgusting, the things he was searching, and I was not aware of any level of, of the dark, dark things he was looking into, but we're just going to talk about a few of them now. So majority of his searches in the build-up to the shooting included graphic searches relating to underaged girls. But there are also numerous searches uh, that related to extreme violence, decapitations, terrorist incidents, a lot of searches relating to the Virginia Tech shooter, the Columbine shooters. There's loads of different, I mean, one bizarre one here, Woman's Viagra for sale. Yeah, police shooting videos, stands out, school shooter footage. You see the uh, the documentary on school shooting simulator. Do you know yeah. about that? No. There was a game made, literally a school shooting simulator. 
it was put on Steam, which is like a public platform to download games and stuff. That's pretty crazy. It's crazy. It got banned eventually, but yeah, jeez, yeah, it's it's very very concerning this list, and I don't know what a porn uniform is, but that's one of the searches. A porn uniform. Some very dark searches there. Linda Cruz said that if she tried to enter Nicholas Cruz's bedroom, he would scream at her or physically force her to leave. When he was out of the house, she claimed to find four knives in his room, but never firearms. Linda complained that Nicholas would intentionally leave food out to attract bugs to make her life miserable. Cruz would say, get off your fat ass and clean it, or go kill yourself so that way we could all be happy. So this next part is pretty significant in the build-up uh, to the events that we're going to talk about. So Linda Cruz would go on to tell her friends that Nicholas was very good at making people think that he doesn't know what he's doing. When I read about this, I, all I was thinking of was that the full interrogation of Cruz just a few hours after he was apprehended is available online. And it's debatable that he was trying to give the impression that he was either having a psychotic episode mm. or some form of breakdown. But from what his mum says here, he's very good at making people think that he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. She was also adamant that Nicholas knew exactly what he is doing, but played people into thinking that he had had such a horrible life and that he had been bullied and was depressed, but that this was not the case. The impression, she said, was that Nicholas was highly manipulative. There's similar arguments to be made about the Columbine shooting because some people argue actually they weren't bullied nearly as much as it's reported they were, and in fact they actually bullied other people. Nicholas here, all we see is him telling his mum one version of events and not mentioning any of these other horrific things that he's said and done. That's important to note if you do go on to watch the um, the full interrogation and also his current court battles and sentencing because... Well, even him wearing those glasses, <sighs> I feel like that's such a play of making and him look big. small and look, make him look weak and small and... Oversized yeah. dressed shirts. Yeah. yeah. So Linda Cruz died on the 1st of November as a result of pneumonia. She was 68 years old. On the day that she died, Linda's cousin made a call to the police to warn them that Nick was a school shooter in the making and to take his guns away immediately. And that's remarkable that she's gone to make that call and like make the call on the day that she died. It, yeah. it shows the urgency she felt it needed to happen. Because I think as well, there were worries that basically after Roger passed away, Roger's finances went through to, or his estate went to Linda. Mm. As soon as Linda yeah. died away, there was not as much immediate... I mean, I guess there was blood family available, but a lot of the money was still available to, to Nicholas sure. and um, Zachary. Nicholas Cruz had apparently described his adoptive mother, Linda, as politically a complete liberal. And when Linda died, Cruz placed a MAGA hat, Make America Great Again, on a gravesite because he thought it'd be funny. This action was later proven by a photograph located on Cruz's phone. Shortly after her death, Nicholas attended a local bank with his mother's bank card as well as a female guardian. Emotionless, he requested to know how much money was in the account and how quickly he was able to access it because he had things to do. So this is really scary now. So there's there's no kind of legal guardian, I suppose, over, over Nicholas at this point. He goes on to live with various friends and relatives, with one particular uh, school friend claiming that in one instance whilst at middle school, Cruz basically described that both of his parents were dead and that he lived with his grandmother, who he would beat up regularly. So Cruz went on to live briefly with a family friend, Roxanne Deschamps, outside uh, of Palm Beach in Florida. But this situation also seemed to end quite badly. According to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, Cruz said that he got in a fight with Deschamps' son, seriously injuring him. And when police officers arrived to investigate the fight, he would basically give up. And remember what his mum said about mm. him, highly manipulative, given the ability to, to claim he looks like he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. He told police that he basically lashed out because he was grieving the loss of his mother and Roxanne's son had made comments about his parents passing away. The quote uh, from Nicholas in the statement said, The thing is, I lost my mother a couple of days ago, so, like, I'm dealing with a bunch of things right now. I kind of got mad, and I started punching walls and stuff, and a kid came at me and threw me on the ground, and he kicked me out the house. When in actual fact, the son that allegedly did this was left far worse off than mm. Nicholas in this situation. So it's, again, really interesting how he's transcribing the events. In a separate call to 911, Deschamps told the dispatcher that she was afraid Cruz would come back to the house with a gun and that he demonstrated violent behaviour several times in the past. He put the gun on the head of his brothers before, so it's not the first time, and he did this to his mum. 
It's not the first time he's put a gun on somebody's head, Shem said on the 911 recordings. No arrests were made. According to the police report, a sheriff's deputy picked Cruz up from a nearby park and returned him to the Sharps' home. So there's, just, there's just conflict everywhere this guy goes. One student of, I mean, we mentioned the specialist school that uh, Cruz attended. One student described Cruz as awkward and said that he made bad jokes about Jewish people, Nazis and Hitler. And they said that Cruz would also say things like, I wish all the Jews were dead and was often frequently racist towards African-Americans. Alongside uh, various racist behaviours, Cruz would also bring deceased animals to school with their heads removed. Cruz would also show other students and was proud of the animals he had killed. This student also said that Cruz would draw swastikas at lunch and also on school desks. All I remember from school desks were the S's, like the free line and the little... Super many ones. Yeah. The warning signs were absolutely there. That something that is absolutely astonishing is that there were 48 unreported slash reported but not acted on troubling signs regarding Nicholas Cruz. And when they are listed as follows, it becomes heartbreakingly infuriating to know that the shooting was not prevented from happening. So the following um, reflects the categories of Cruz's behaviour which were uninvestigated. So some of them weren't reported, but some of them were reported and weren't basically followed up. Seven incidents of animal cruelty, 19 incidents where Cruz was in possession of a firearm or a knife, eight statements of hatred toward a group or a person, 11 statements of desire to hurt or kill people, and three specific statements about a school shooting. So, yeah, when you look at that list, it's... This is crazy. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Mm. Especially as school shootings is such a thing over there. It's not like it's like, oh, we haven't had one for numerous decades or this not, it's not uncommon. Th- it's common, sadly. Like, it's heartbreaking yeah. to say, but it is. It's like these things, it's like... And if, if this is ignorant on my part as well, Parkland is quite a, uh, an affluent area. The mm. schools are considered to be really, really good areas. It's one of the safest cities in the, in the whole state. If someone's going around committing this number of these mm. acts that are uh, 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 this level of severity surely that puts more of a spotlight on him. 48 of these things before, well, well, no one did take any action. Mm. So as well as the list that Tom's mentioned, Cruz also continued to kill animals with uh, a BB gun. He also once killed a duck with a tire iron. The killings occurred on a monthly basis. One thing that's also very interesting and, and quite predominant in his ongoing sentencing right now is that he posted all sorts of things on various social media platforms, but predominantly on Instagram and Snapchat, including on July 10th of 2017, he uploaded a photo to his Instagram of a dead frog laying next to its own remains. So he basically gutted this frog with the caption, these things killed my dog, so I kill them pretty much. And it's, it's an absolutely hideous image. So there was a, a female student from Marjorie Stoneman who knew Nicholas Cruz well because he had previously dated her friend. And I believe this was one of the very few female friends that he did have. Basically said that he was abusive not only towards the female that he dated, but towards her. And they had seen images on his phone that he had claimed to have killed frogs, lizards and squirrels. And he would also regularly upload to Snapchat pictures of deceased animals, also including shooting at alligators in the eyes. So Cruz threatened this witness via Instagram in 2016 after his relationship with the other female ended. Cruz told her that he would kill her, rape her and hurt her family and kill all the people that she cared about. Cruz would sometimes throw things at her when she was eating her lunch. She said that Cruz had also threatened his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend. Cruz physically attacked the new boyfriend at school in late 2016. She knew him as the weird kid in middle school. Cruz would do things intentionally to make people laugh or do something weird. I'm not hearing a lot of stories about him making people laugh. No. Just a lot of weird, aggressive, violent behaviour. She claimed that another friend had told her that she received a bird's head from Cruz. She said that Cruz claimed that he worshipped Satan and that Cruz had previously posted pictures of himself wearing a gas mask, a body armour suit, as well as holding weapons. And also you can kind of see similar images to this that he uploaded to Instagram. So he usually either wore bandanas over his mouth, scarves over his face, balaclavas, a lot of baseball caps. He often tried to keep his key features um, disguised. To this um, friend of his ex-girlfriend as well, he made a vague threat about shooting up the school, basically claiming that he was tired of everyone being so mean to him and bullying him and that he couldn't take it and he wanted to shoot up the school. When confronted about this, he changed his story completely, saying he was only joking. He felt bullied because he was into hunting and the outdoors and other people at the school weren't too into this, which again is just completely twisting the narrative compared to what he's actually doing. 
and the majority of the students just thought that he was weird and creepy. Once again, none of this information was ever reported to law enforcement until after what we're going to go on to talk about. So as well as uploading pictures of animals that he had abused, he would also upload images of his arms that he claimed he had, uh, well, he had multiple scars on each arm that were self-inflicted wounds caused by the knives that he owned. And not only were the police familiar with Cruz, but the FBI were also notified about Cruz. So yeah, the FBI was notified about Cruz after he left a comment on a Mississippi bail bondsman's uh, YouTube channel. His name was Ben Benight. And the comment basically said, I'm going to be the next professional school shooter. So Ben Benight reported the comment as spam and immediately alerted the FBI. Yeah, which is great from him. But yeah, it, it obviously didn't lead to anything or any interaction there. The Bureau received a second tip on the January 5th, weeks before Cruz carried out the shooting at Stoneman Douglas. The caller, who the FBI said was a person close to the suspect, warned that Cruz had a desire to kill people and worried about the potential of him conducting a school shooting. Cruz attended Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School for a while, which is an incredibly well-regarded school, but was expelled for disciplinary reasons after assaulting another student at the school. The school administration had circulated an email to teachers warning that Cruz had made threats against other students. The school banned him from wearing a backpack on campus, which, yeah, I mean, that, so obviously they have fear about him and what he could possibly do. The high school's motto was be positive, be passionate and be proud which I think are all things that he very much wasn't. Before we go into the timeline, uh, the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School um, had been, in weeks leading up to this particular day, practising a code red situation for the school, which n apparently numerous schools across America, this is kind of quite common, where basically they practise the event of an active shooter being on school campus. They instruct teachers and children on uh, the appropriate things to do and um, protocol to follow. A lot of people sort of mentioned that the fact that they were practicing so many simulations or active shooter scenarios in the lead up to events is that a lot of people on the day of the actual shooting felt that this was a drill. When they practice a code red, there's going to be a fake shooter and we're going to practice a code red. So some people believe that students, as a result of doing this so many times, did not take the actual mm. protocol seriously. And that would prove to be quite a fatal reaction on the day of the actual shooting. And now we're going to go into the timeline of the Nicholas Cruz Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. February 14th, 2018. Valentine's Day of 2018 starts like any other day of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Students flitter in and out of classrooms, gossiping in doorways, exchanging Valentine's cards and rushing to make it to their next class before the bell goes. Unbeknown to students and teachers going about their regular day, Nicholas Cruz, an ex-student of Marjorie Stoneman, who was expelled from the school the year before due to undisclosed disciplinary reasons, is about to change the significance of the 14th of February forevermore. So as this event transpired over one day, we're going to now look at the timeline minute by minute. So 2.06pm, Nicholas Cruz calls an Uber from his house, destination Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. He is dressed up in a maroon t-shirt, branded with the school's logo, dark trousers and a black baseball cap. He is carrying a backpack and a duffel bag containing a gun and numerous rounds of ammunition. 2.19pm. The Uber arrives at Cruz's intended destination. Cruz gets out of the car, puts on his backpack, picks up the duffel bag and strides with a particular purpose towards the main school building. School resource officer Scott Peterson spots Cruz arriving. Recognising the ex-student and knowing that Cruz is not welcome on campus due to his previous expulsion, he issues a radio message raising awareness that Cruz is on site and heading towards Building 12. Now, we mentioned the Code Red drills that the school were practising in the months prior. It's important to note that a Code Red incident is not called at this time, later blaming a training technicality as the reason for initial hesitation. So as well as the uh, backpack and black duffel bag, Cruz also had with him a guitar case and the, he was spotted with this by not only the Uber driver but multiple students as he entered the building. So a couple minutes later, Cruz enters building 12 and immediately unpacks the black bag he'd been carrying in the stairwell. He pulls on an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. During this preparation, he comes face to face with 15-year-old student Chris McKenna, who is out of the class on a bathroom break and Cruz warns him, you better get out of here, things are going to start getting messy. Chris recalls having a horrific inkling over what was about to take place. He runs from the building and bumps into coach Aaron Feiss. Feiss leads McKenna to the school's baseball field and instructs him to wait there whilst he heads back towards the building 12 to investigate further. Feiss will unfortunately become one of the lives that Cruz claims as part of his deadly attack. As McKenna runs from the building, Cruz immediately opens fire, shooting at random into multiple classrooms. 
shattering windows and penetrating doors and lockers with bullets on the first floor. From the initial hallway attack, three are killed and one person is injured. Mass hysteria breaks out in Building 12 amongst teachers and the students who are hearing and seeing the events unfold. Those who have not already been hit take cover where they can and hope and pray that the shooter bypasses them. Others start live broadcasting the shooting via social media. And that's the thing, there is so much mobile phone footage and audio of this event, it's chilling insight into a mass shooting. Cruz turns his attention to classroom 1216, where he fires directly into the room. One person is killed and a further three injured. After this fatal attack, Cruz spends a few seconds stood outside the door, reloading his gun with ammunition. Once his task is completed, he moves towards class 1214. The 30 students in classroom 1214 have been studying the Holocaust as part of their history syllabus when Cruz open fires on them. Six people are hit, two of which are killed instantly. Scott Peterson, the school resource officer mentioned earlier, issues a radio statement over the school's channel to colleagues claiming, be advised we have possible, could be firecrackers, I think we have shots fired, possible shots fired, 1200 building. I mean, it already seems incredibly incompetent. Yeah, there's a, a lot of criticism over this particular individual. We're going to talk in more detail about him shortly, but he doesn't seem very sure in himself or what he's seeing and hearing whatsoever. Yeah. The school fire alarm is set off during the chaos and as a result, students and staff start pouring out into the corridors and start evacuating the building. Cruz continues to stalk the hallway, firing at random into doorways and classrooms. He kills two more and he injures another two more people. The first 911 call is made just minutes later and officers are dispatched to the school. Whilst all of this is going on, Scott Peterson is shown on camera outside Building 12 alongside another school security guard. Peterson will later come under heavy criticism for seemingly not acting with intention to disable the shooter, and a picture of him stood next to a white pole appearing to do nothing will end up circulating the national news stations. Keep in mind that Peterson was an armed school security officer. Crews fires into classroom 1213, resulting in another death and three more injured. He changes direction and heads towards the stairs, intending to head up to the second floor and continue his attack there. There's this graphic, it's either NBC or CNN or a particular American news channel where it's literally real time diagram of him going into various rooms and it's color coded on basically shot and survived, shot and killed, wow. not shot at all. And his is like a red dot going around different buildings. It's haunting to watch. The next minute, Cruz comes face to face with a member of staff on the stairs. Cruz shoots and kills them before mercilessly stepping over the body and taking the stairs to the floor above. He strolls casually down the hallway, firing from left to right, but thankfully no one is injured or killed during the second floor incident. Cruz arrives to the third floor to be greeted by a number of fleeing students and teachers. When they realise the tutor is coming towards them, they retreat in fear back to the classroom they fled moments ago. A teacher is shot by Cruz outside room 1256, and other students are also shot as Cruz continues his random firing spree into various classrooms. Cruz then takes a moment to reload again, during which time a number of students run for their lives. Once reloaded, he turns towards the fleeing students and opens fire. He hits three students, two of which die. Within the next 10 seconds, he fatally shoots two students he previously hit and who had been laying injured as a result of one of his earlier attacks. Cruz fires, killing another student. This is his last shot to hit a victim. Cruz makes his way up to the staff room, where he sets up a bipod, a device similar to a tripod that is used to steady shots. It is clear that his intention here is to act as a sniper, picking off further victims on the ground below. He spends close to two minutes attempting to fire through windows, and it is only a result of the hurricane-proof glass that he is unable to cause any further casualties, thankfully. So some of the uh, surviving testimonies of this is that he would shoot the windows of the classroom doors through and it would have been possible for him to reach his hand through and just open the door mm. and go in but he for some reason didn't think of that well thankfully didn't think of that and instead just shot lent as much in of yeah. his body in and just started shooting at random absolutely hideous the amount of victims he's claimed it's the deadliest school shooting to date bearing in mind everything we've covered up to now is over a four minute period at 2 26 p.m scott peterson radios to say we're locking down the school right now the police are still yet to arrive at this point Cruz, who remains in the staff room, fires his last shots and then quickly exits, dropping the gun and his backpack in the third floor stairwell. He runs down the stairs and attempts to blend in with other students and staff members who were evacuating the school buildings. 2.32pm, police enter building 12 of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, approximately 11 minutes after the first shots are fired. They are informed that the suspect is wearing an ROTC uniform, which is a reserve officer's training corps. At 2.36pm, more officers arrive on the scene and enter Building 12. 
However, Cruz is long gone by then, and although police come face to face with a gruesome scene of bodies and blood, their perpetrator is nowhere to be found. At 2.50 p.m., Nicholas Cruz arrives at a nearby Walmart where he is caught on the camera buying a drink from a subway inside the store. He pays the cashier and then leaves. At 3.01 p.m., Cruz, clearly unsure what to do with himself after unleashing the deadly attack, then arrives at a McDonald's. He doesn't order anything but sits down at one of the restaurant's tables where he remains for less than a minute before getting up and walking out again. And that's a really haunting section of the timeline as well because he sits down at McDonald's on a table with a sibling of one of the victims he's just shot and just starts chatting with them as if oh, nothing's yeah. happened. Absolutely horrific. 3.11pm, injured students on site at the school are being treated and at the same time the President of the United States, Donald Trump, is briefed on the fatal school shooting. At 3.41pm, a patrol and police officer notices somebody who bears a resemblance to the ID fit put out in the relation to the recent school shooting. Realising it is the perp, the police officer arrests Cruz. Cruz submits without incident, but he's taken directly to the hospital as he shows signs of laboured breathing. Once treated at the hospital, Cruz is then handed over to police custody. And the laboured breathing, like we said, it could be his little defence mechanism that he's brought up yeah. in terms of trying to show be feeble and be weak and there's video there's body cam footage of him being arrested and there's an officer holding him down but he's saying he's talking about seeing things like well the, the demons the demons the mm. demons so he's already starting yeah. this, this charade now what's going on today bro the, the, the demons man demons voices yeah, no problem. Voices. Voice, voices and demons where's the voices Holy what happened? Shut up. Just be quiet, man. Shut up. At 3.50 p.m., Donald Trump tweets, My prayers and condolences to the families of the victims of the terrible Florida shooting. No child, teacher, or anyone else should ever feel unsafe in an American school. Best impression I've ever heard of Donald Trump. My prayers. I can't really do Whoa, Trump. God, that wasn't... Was that had potential? We're going to build a wall. No, I can't. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, started yeah. off right. China! China! 3.53 p.m., the police conduct a final sweep of the school and help to evacuate all remaining people and aid those who still were injured. At 6 p.m., Nicholas Cruz arrives at the sheriff's office in a blue hospital gown. After 30 minutes of questioning, Cruz admits he is responsible for the event, which is now on record as the worst school shooting in the history of the United States, with a total of 17 dead and many more injured. During the 6 minutes and 40 seconds that Nicholas Cruz spent shooting inside Building 12 of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, he killed 14 students and three members of staff. Their names were Alyssa Aladef, aged 14, Scott Beagle, 35, Martin Angueno, aged 14, Nicholas Dwaret, aged 17, Aaron Feist, aged 37, Jamie Gutenberg, aged 14, Chris Hickson, aged 49, Luke Hoyer, aged 15, Cara Lauren, aged 14, Gina Montalto, aged 14, Joaquin Oliver, aged 17, Elena Petty, aged 14. Meadow Pollock, aged 18. Helena Ramsey, aged 17. Alex Schachter, aged 14. Carmen Shentrup, aged 16. And Peter Wang, aged 15. So a little more on the victims of this horrific attack. So geography teacher Scott Beagle, who was shot and killed after he unlocked a classroom for students to enter and hide from crews. Aaron Feist, an assistant football coach and security guard, was killed shielding two students from the gunfire. Chris Hickson, the school's athletic director, was killed as he ran towards the sound of the gunfire. So just on that, those three adults have done so much more than Scott Peterson even began to do. Yeah, they're running towards the gunfire unarmed. Whilst uh, he's armed and trying anything he can to stay away from Yes, them. Chris Hickson, he tried to attempt to help the fleeing students. Student Peter Wang was last seen wearing his junior reserve officer's training corps uniform. He held doors open so people could flee as quickly as possible. Sadly, Peter was unable to escape, unlike the many that he helped. Cruz would fatally shoot Peter before he had the chance to flee, and Peter Wang's actions had been described as heroic. A petition was submitted to the White House for him to be buried with full military honours. Alyssa Aladef was the captain of the Parkland Football Club. Around three weeks after the shooting, she was honoured by the United States women's national soccer team prior to their game in Orlando, where her teammates of her team she played for and her, and her family were invited to the game and presented with official jerseys that featured her name. Meadow Pollock was a senior who was shot four times. As Cruz fired into other classrooms, Pollock crawled to a classroom door but wasn't able to get inside. Cara Lufferin, a freshman, was alongside Pollock, and Pollock covered Lufferin in an attempt to shield her from the bullets. The shooter returned to the classroom and located Pollock and Lufferin discharging his weapon five more times and killing both girls. So that just shows you the heroics and how people just 
you know, knew what was happening and they just gave up their life or gave up their lives willingly to yeah. to protect other people. It's, it's astonishing the people that's well how young they are doing yeah. those things. It's you literally can't imagine it. There's also some people who are, who who left there with injuries and, and survived and we're gonna talk about them now. Fifteen year old Anthony Borge was discharged from hospital on April fourth, nearly two months after the attack. He was dubbed the real Iron Man. Borge was shot five times after he used his body to barricade the door of a classroom where twenty students were inside. Wow. Just think about a fifteen year old holding that door and stopping people being shot five, five times. times. Borge was honoured with a humanitarian award at the 28 Bet Awards, and that's the Black Entertainment Television. With Columbine, to an extent, you could argue that they were targeting uh, the jocks, African-Americans, bullies. With this, Nicholas Cruz is just anyone. Yeah. Boy, girl, old, young. It's just so indiscriminate and, and just random. completely at random. Mm. So sadly, this wasn't the end of loss of life in the incident. Many staff and students after the incident have suffered from survivor's guilt and PTSD. On March 17th, 2019, 13 months after the shooting, 19-year-old Sidney Aiello, who survived and whose friend Meadow Pollock had been killed during the shooting, died by suicide after struggling to attend college. She was terrified of being in the classroom and also had been treated for survivor's guilt and PTSD. Less than a week later, a 16-year-old boy who had survived the shooting died by suicide. So it just goes to show that it isn't just the case of people out there that people have lost their lives that day and some people are injured these these injuries are you know the, the mental scars as well and things are always can be with it, with you and people are going to be terrified of certain events ptsd it's it's a ripple effect from these things it's not just a yeah. case of that day was horrible and everyone moves on this thing lives in the community and in these people's lives you know, forever it's it's absolutely horrible yeah the amount of trauma inflicted on not only the victims but the survivors the victims families the survivors families the whole town the whole city the whole state the whole country the whole world yeah it's i don't know if that's exactly necessarily what nicholas cruz was trying to do he didn't seem to crave infamy well actually that's that's that's, that's an interesting point because some of his videos of hit that he uploaded of him saying i'm going to be the next school shooter i'm going to do this i'm going to do that on that point it's interesting because yeah he did he did record the certain videos which we'll, we'll play some of them now hello my name is nick and i'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. my goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds, I think I can do a good done. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's gonna be a big event. And when you see me on the news, we'll all know who I am. <laughs> You're all going to die. Pew, 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 pew. Oh yeah, can't wait. And the way he's just kind of casually saying it, saying some of those phrases and laughing after he says it, it, it has a little bit of Elliot Roger about it, but a different kind of vibe. It seems very infantile and the way he says things. And yeah. she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then, no, I'm gonna actually, no, what's it called? It's called the quad or whatever. And he's just, he's just, yeah, it's so, it's so bizarre. So we're going to go into the aftermath now. Uh, as, we, as Ben mentioned, Scott Peterson, the school resource deputy, uh, came under heavy criticism, which I think, to be honest, is fairly justified. The blame was mainly placed on him as a result of the footage obtained from the event showing him to be stood around not doing anything in particular during the time of the attack. The Browood County Sheriff, Scott Israel, addressed the TV cameras after the attack and made his feelings quite clear to the world. In the case of Scott Peterson, our school resource deputy, I want to clarify any rumours. He was armed, he was in uniform, after seeing video witness statements and Scott Peterson's very own statement, I decided this morning to suspend Scott Peterson without pay pending an internal investigation. It's quite staggering when you see some of the quotes that actually come directly from Peterson, which he said over calls. There was a name for him that, well, there was a hashtag that started trending as well, which was uh, Scott Peterson, the Broward Coward. Seven minutes after the government entered the building, Mr. Peterson said of the radio, Broward, do not approach at the 12 or 1300 buildings, stay at least 500 feet away at this point. It's very bizarre that he's in, he's like he's basically instructing people to stay away who are people who are coming to help and yeah it's the fact that he's yeah he's armed that literally is his job and I mean, he would have went through training in order in order to obviously be able to mitigate these situations. President Trump um, called him a coward and alluding to his own heroic sense. He said, "You know, I really believe you don't know until you test it, but I really believe I'd run in there even if I didn't have a weapon." And obviously Trump, you know, that's very sounds very Trump. Trump. The talk, yeah. But then a lot of people, a lot of teachers did run out in there with our weapon and they run in there to protected students and students protected other students. And this this man was stood outside. I mean, I, I, it's so easy for us to say, oh, well, it obviously it would have been absolutely terrifying, but then don't take the job if you can't, you know. And it's like, like we said, sadly, this isn't a one case and, you know, this, hap yeah. this happens sadly in America. Even the fact that they the kids are conditioned, used to, 
experiencing drills of any kind, how horrifying is that to know that you, your kids would go through something like that, even a drill, yeah. and have to prepare for the likely situation of an, an active school Yeah, the shooter. fact that yeah, like I was, when you were saying it earlier on, it's just thinking that how, how bad has it got that that is like, you know, an everyday thing, oh, we're going to do drills to practice for this well interestingly uh trump's tweets regarding you know or, or comments regarding going in there without a weapon coincidentally came at a time that he was spearheading the idea to train and have armed teachers in schools the case sparked worldwide gun debates once again which they all these school students always do but the nra and program politicians all coming under severe criticism the school's response to this event was grief counseling was provided for the families affected by the Parkland shooting, and the state of Florida offered to cover the funeral fees for the victims. Since the shooting, the school has reassessed its health and safety procedures, limiting the amount of entrances to the school and stepping up the security measures with ID badges for students and staff, metal detectors and transparent book bags. Law enforcement are now posted at every school entrance. I remember seeing the transparent, they're basically transparent backpacks, mm. and I didn't know the context of them when I saw them. I thought it was like a new sort of trend. Yeah. But the context is they are clear so you can see the contents and it's just, I couldn't get over that. It was mind-blowing to me that, yeah. that they even had to... Go to that extent. Yeah, yeah. So there are also some, uh, I remember this as well, there were a, a, a number of different conspiracy theories uh, surrounding um, the event itself. Some of these have been argued to have come from more right-wing individuals and also people that are maybe pro-gun law. So one of the particular conspiracy theories started doing the rounds with some people saying that the shooting actually never took place and the students caught on camera during and after the attack were not real students of the school and were in fact paid crisis actors, supposedly to gather more attention to support anti-gun laws. One of the particular individuals that came under large focus of this conspiracy theory was David Hogg, who was the son of a retired FBI agent. And he was a prominent name that gets banded around with regards to this particular theory. And he was someone that was very much an activist in the wake of the event. So in the wake of the shooting, Hogg became a very vocal anti-gun supporter, organising nationwide rallies, which pro-Trump supporters took as a direct attack on the president. Controversy was also raised when Donald Trump Jr. was seen to like two tweets that suggested this was the case. This is slightly different to our usual case because the the court proceedings are actually currently happening right now as time of recording and there's not been an actual sentence given to uh, Nicholas Cruz. Being, that's been because of course some of it, the sentencing at the moment is likely mm. to be kind of autumn, mid full time and that is some of the most, even his defence team Cruz's defense mm. team were crying. Yeah, in some of the witness statements. Yeah, exactly. We just just shows goes to show like the power of those statements and just yeah how this whole event seemed so avoidable and yeah it, it, it was so pointless. It was so preventable. All of it. The amount of what was it? Forty eight reports or warnings, severe warnings about Cruz. So yeah, it's July 6, 2022, four years, five months, four days after the attack, saw the sentencing trial against Nicholas Cruz begin. So obviously we can't comment on the final um, sentencing because it hasn't happened at, at the time of recording. But there was the footage of him be in the interrogation where his brother Zachary comes in or his stepbrother Zachary comes in. Zachary kind of, he takes some of the blame a little bit. He says, you know, how he treated him and he basically calls him out for being a monster. And mm -hmm. he, it, it's really heartbreaking to see Zachary yeah. and what he had to say and and... I do think what his mother said, Linda said about him being able to act as if things weren't his fault, or he wasn't aware of what he was doing. Yeah. He's kind of he was playing like, Zachary a little bit. Is that too hard? Depends how manipulative, like how how manipulative he is. But it did fit, it come across like as if he'd just woken up and he realised what he'd yeah. done. Which but then I, it was also the second he clocked the security cameras. Mm. That's when the show started. Yeah, so. it's a very peculiar case, as we mentioned earlier on, with Nicholas's uh, birth mother uh, taking drugs, hard drugs, and drinking when when he when she was pregnant with him. I mean, we don't know exactly the effects that would have had. But it sounds like um, Linda and Roger were... They did the best they, they, did the best they, they could. could. I mean, you could argue maybe she was too easy on him. Well, I, I do think social services have a responsibility the 23rd time the police, the police get called. I don't know how that hasn't been intervened even then. And then all the numerous times the FBI was told that this kid was saying that he was going to be a school shooter. If it, I know it's so easy for us to sit here after the event and say all these things, mm -hmm. but... Again, you hope from this, um, people learn lessons and take that forward and are able to kind of prevent things like this happening in the future. But as we said, from June, there's been, what, 63 new mass, new mass shootings in America. So and obviously not all of them are school shootings, but some of them are. So it, it's... Can I tell you something shocking? Yeah. There was a mass shooting today. Really? Injuring nine. There was three mass shootings yesterday. Injuring about 15, killing two. There was a mass shooting on August 5th. Three, in fact. It's unbelievable.
you don't it's it's one of those things because obviously we're over here in the uk and we hear probably hear more about when it's like a school shooting or something like that we don't hear about the other daily events that happen in each state i mean each state is obviously so vast and big and well over here we only recently had the first live televised trial in the uk didn't we are some of these people being inspired by seeing things like this on television all the time it's tricky isn't it i mean that's the thing it's like what is the influence on, on the, the infamy and he he very much idolised the um, Columbine shooters and you could argue, obviously we know online that people kind of, the Columbiners support them and stuff. It's, it, it just seemed like a bit of a game to him. Even the fact he says his goal was 20 people. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, we played the video. My name is Nick. I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and some tracer rounds. It's going to be a big event and when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. You're all going to die. I can't wait. And we'll play a bit of um, some of the testimony given by some of the students and the, uh, the, the family affected from the shooting now. I want to share something with you all that I've never said publicly before. My son wishes it was him. He struggles with the reality that he could not save his sister and he wishes it was him. I miss everything about her from her head to her toes. I miss her heart. I miss her soul. I miss my girl. So now 23-year-old Cruz has already pleaded guilty to the killing of 17 staff and students, and he also injured the same number, 17 staff and students. So it is now the court's responsibility to decide what fate beholds him. He will either be sentenced to death or life without the possibility of parole. And uh, the footage of Cruz, I mean, he made his official apology whilst in this sentencing as well, which the judge kind of just swiftly moved on from. It was one of the weakest apologies I've mm. ever ever witnessed Is there anything else that either side wishes to add to the record or or present at this time i believe mr cruz wanted to make a statement to the court and to the victims yes. present yes. in the courtroom okay may i take off my mask sure i am very sorry for what i did and i have to live with it every day and that if i were to get a second chance i would do everything in my power to try to help others and i am doing this for you and i do not care if you do not believe me and i love you and I know you don't believe me, but I have to live with this every day and it brings me nightmares and I can't live with myself sometimes, but I try to push through because I know that's what you guys would want me to do. I hate drugs and I believe this country would do better if everyone would stop smoking marijuana and doing all these drugs and causing racism and violence out in the streets. I'm sorry and I can't even watch TV anymore. And I'm trying my best to maintain my composure and I just want you to know I'm really sorry and I hope you give me a chance to try to help others. If, you, if I believe it's your decision to decide where I go and whether I live or die, not the jury's, I believe it's your decision. I'm sorry. Yeah. So footage of Cruz in court shows him covering his ears and hiding his face during audio being played to the court from the day of the shooting, with shots being fired and students heard screaming and crying. There was a podcast I was listening to the other the other day. Very well produced, lots of sound mm. effects, lots of audio editing and things like that. But they played so many sound bites from extracted from phones and I couldn't listen to it anymore. Yeah. It was like there were no trigger warnings or anything like that. And yeah. it's just a really harsh insight into the idea of a school shooting. Definitely. So one thing that did happen as well after he went through his first trial is that Cruz was allowed to reconnect with his biological mother. So they, they held a, a video call together shortly before she died of cancer. And why would he even be allowed that? Why would you grant mm. him that? Or her, because she's a criminal. So that was the case of Nicholas Cruz, the Parkland shooter. And now as we do try and get a little bit of levity and like relief in these cases, which I know is, is particularly hard to do. But now we're going to do our segment of lookalikes. What does it look like? That looks a bit like that. It looks a bit like this. Now, Ben, you, you said you weren't too confident with what you got here, boy. No, no. I uh, struggled this week, obviously with the fact that the trials and the sentencing is ongoing right now, which I've been watching some of. It was just, I really struggled looking at him because it just made me angry. But something that Tom pointed out earlier on in the episode is that either him or his legal team, or kind of a combination of both, have made a distinct effort 
to make him appear even more dorky or harmless or yeah small and childlike yeah they're basically dressing him in, in a really polite fashion the oversized glasses the big dress shirt it's like the Menendez brothers and they made him wear jumpers and stuff like that to kind of soften their character exactly exactly so during his recent apology one thing I've gone with in apologies that this is uh, probably my weakest one ever but who knows hopefully it brings some brightness into an otherwise very dark case so whilst making his recent apology uh, to the judge and the jury he's dressed pretty similarly to the Joker when he's making his efforts at stand-up comedy that is terrible yeah yeah, I did. I did say I struggled. I, did, I didn't. I did not like looking at pictures of him. I mean, I didn't like looking at pictures of him. I mean, You've I, probably done better than me. The other one, which I, I, I've written it down here, that might be my worst one yet. But the other one I've got, as I mentioned, not enjoyed looking at photos of him. But yeah. I thought again, as I couldn't just leave it on the Joker one. I've been struggling just before, you know, just while we were prepping to come on. I've gone with a young Ben Stiller. That's not a bad shout. Sorry, Ben. So I've gone with. I think when he's got the big glasses on. He looks like the man from, from Up when he's young, a little bit. Not great shout. But then I also thought, take away the glasses there, Ben. Looks a little bit like oh, James Milner. Oh, wow. I think Milner wins it's it. It's a little bit. It's, it's got a bit of a strong jaw, isn't he? A little bit like Milner. Which is, sorry for James Milner, it's a horrible thing to say you look like. Yeah, it looked like his ear was hard this week. So, yeah, I'm not going to not gonna slay it yours too, too badly this week. It was a very heavy case. Like we said, big shout out to Phil for the animation, um, honouring the victims of, of the case. It, it was a heavy one. Yeah, I think it's this kind of. I think it is important to talk about these kind of cases and kind of shed light on it and shed the kind of reason why these things need to be looked at and you know things need to change in order to prevent things like this happening in the future. And hopefully, hopefully something does actually get done about it. But you know, for every passing day, it seems like another one happens and not much is actually rectified. Yeah. I mean, some of the some of the stats that Dan has shared with us whilst whilst we've been filming is just harrowing. Did, did yeah. you- the numbers now, and they all have been for many, many years, the numbers now are just incomprehensive. They're just, they don't sound real. No, no. And that's, that's tragic, absolutely tragic. But yes, thank you everyone for listening or for watching. We do audio and video episodes of every, every case that we cover. We appreciate that this one was probably a little... Um, heavier heavier than than ordinarily we would we would cover but we wanted to cover it so yeah and yeah quick shout out to um gully garms who've been dressing us this series you see the florida themed t-shirts here with, uh, with our lovely raffle shirts a big shout out to them and uh, also you can use our codes kill ben or kill tom for 30 percent off at gully garms and they've got some great items over there so why not go check them out yes guys thank you again for all your support we very much appreciate it if you're after more content we do have a patreon page if you search like a podcast on there it will come up we've also got all of the uh, all of the social medias instagram twitter facebook tiktok um just at could murder a pod or for tiktok at i could murder a pod we've also got a merch shop so we've got a merch shop i think that's the the term yeah Uh, so icmap.store for all your i could murder a podcast goodies and uh that that's pretty much it from us yes yes indeed and like we always say guys we say this all the time keep doing what you're doing shooting alligators in the straight in the eyes yeah yeah i can't punch you in the hole in the wall if you lose call of duty Hitting a kid with a ladle. Hitting a kid with a ladle, yeah. Wow. All right, guys. Until next time. See you later. Take care of yourself. It's all right? You take care of yourself, too. No, it wasn't to you. It was to them. You can just... Oh, blood's coming through. Look. Still going on about it a week later. Wow. Well, two weeks later. Actually. Wow. Yeah. All best, stupid. Hello and welcome back to another I Could Murder a podcast at that time again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just before we we started, we were playing around with some cocktails. And Dan, if you could describe yourself as a cocktail, what cocktail would it be and why? Fucking hell. <laughs> it's too much. Too much. Too much. <laughs>